Okay, ladies and gentlemen, no intro this time. Sorry about the uh, mishaps before. Uh, life happens, and of course, of course, um, you know, I've got the worst luck in the world. You would think it's an actual Friday the 13th right now. But um, look, we're here. We're back. And um, I, here we go. So, Tom, you know, yes. thank you again so much for being here. So as people come in, we'll start again, you know. If if you if you will, going back, I want to know what young Tom was like, and you know what was the first, you know, when you got bit by the horror bug, and, and in terms of just film in general and in music too. I would love to know where that kind of starts for you. Now that I can hear you very properly. Okay, great. Um, and Christian, don't don't sweat the technology thing. I mean, I I teach a film class, and I've been teaching it online, obviously because of the pandemic. And then I had to go back and we start, you know, start up again in a sound stage. And there's all this, you know, new technology, new, you know, Zoom things. I've got students from China, from Japan, all over the world. And I'm I'm up there like an idiot trying to make <laughs> this new technology work. And nothing is more frustrating because you swear you got it down, you bring in the experts, and they're up there fiddle fucking, trying to, you know, and you're going, you don't know? How the hell am I gonna know? You know. Yeah. So it, this shit happens, you know. We used to and, it on sunspots. Yeah. Well, good. The crowds, the crowds on my side, and they're on your side because they're like, "God, Tom is such a cool dude. He's not mad at you, Christian." <laughs> no, no. I, 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 my heart goes out to you know everybody that gets messed up with technology. It's it was so easy back in the day. You'd get the film, you know, put it in the film can, you know, you'd send it off. It would get done. Come back. You'd cut it. You know, everything was just physical. It wasn't, you know, all all you know, digital things and things that can, you know, get messed up. But, get messed up. You know, signals, yeah. So, yeah, Tom, let's go. I, I want to know, like I said, you know, I want to know what young Tom was like and what were your first impressions in terms of uh, of falling in love with movies and horror and, and music. What, what was what was it like for a young Tom? Um, well, I had the influence of my father, who was a huge film fanatic, went to USC film school. I basically inherited his dreams because that's what he would talk to me about all the time, you know, movies. And uh, he was the one that took me to my first James Bond movie, Dr. No. And of course, you know, he loved it and loved Ursula Landress. I just loved the whole James Bond, John Connery thing. So the opening of Friday, you can see that influence there with the Circle and Jason, uh, my little tribute, you know, back to oh, yeah. Juan, which was, uh, you know, huge influence. Uh, but in terms of the horror stuff, I get, you know, I started reading Edgar Allan Poe when I was really young and liked that whole vibe of, you know, the, the tortured guy and he's in love with this girl. And I always thought I was a freak. You know, I never thought I'd look good and, and you know, I you know couldn't get the girls like the other guys. So I would identify with the Wolfman, with Dracula, with Frankenstein. I'd watch that shit so much, you know, because they, they used to have a channel out here in Los Angeles where they would run the same movie every night at nine o'clock. So by Friday, you knew all the dialogue and everything of all the classic universal horror movies. So, you know, it was seriously in my blood. Um, then a, a kind of a very strange real thing happened in my life, which was, you know, horrific on a different level. My mother, when I was 11, had a mental breakdown. And suddenly the mother I grew up with, the mother I knew for 11 years was a completely different being and had to be put away in a place which when we'd come visit it, I'm meeting people that were completely mentally off and doing strange things, talking to me like, you know, hello, I'm William Shakespeare. What is your name, son? You know, and it took my reality when, so, you know, then I dropped even deeper into the whole horror thing and kind of escaped into that as a, you know, as a place of comfort, you know. Uh, and after about a year or so, my mother came out of it, came back. Um, you know, I went from the kid raising three kids below me, uh, which was, you know, the end of the childhood very quickly. Uh, but I kind of, have, you know, there's a syndrome they call the Peter Pan syndrome, which is where you don't grow up you're looking at the guy who refuses to grow up, you know, <laughs> you get aborted in your childhood, you go, shit, I got to make up for all those years and I've not stopped. So I, you know, I still have that, you know, this is all great. You know, I love to make movies about 
teenagers and that that first time falling in love and that first time getting your heart broken and all the stuff that goes on. So, you know, you see that a lot, you know, through my work. Um, but it's the it's the horror that I always come back to because there's some sort of poetic reality with it for me. And I, you know, I, I keep writing it. I keep, you know, watching the movies. I'm one of those guys that before the pandemic, every Friday night, whatever horror movie, you know, came out, bang, I was there, eight o'clock show with the Yahoo crowd. And I just wanted to see people respond because when we used to go to the movies, you know, in, in the 70s and 80s, you wouldn't believe the relationship for the audience to the screen. I mean, and so I would purposely put things in my movies so people would respond in the audience and everybody would laugh. For instance, you know, the American Express card, you know, when that floated and I held on that shot, there would always be some j joker in the back of the theater that would go, don't leave home without it, which was, you know, it's big catchphrase back then. Um, and there's just things that along the way you just do, you know, to kind of, let people know that you're having fun with it, which is kind of the approach that I've always taken to horror that, you know, we got to have a good time. It's got to be fun. You know, Halloween's still the, the national holiday to me. Um, I love putting on shows every Halloween. I've now remodeled the front of my house. So it looks like a kind of an old English cottage, you know, with a well. I'm going to have somebody coming up this year, you know, from like the ring out of the, you know, the well with the fly. I mean, it's, a, it's always about putting on a show. Oh, so wow. some of this came from that childhood, you know, that loved this stuff, escaped into this stuff and kind of only left it when I went into rock and roll through the, through the 60s. And that, of course, was another way of performing. And most of the songs are fairly dark subjects, you know, that I mm -hmm. wrote about. So, let's yeah. talk about that. Let's talk about that music for a second, Tom. Mm -hmm. The the sound of the '60s. How impactful was that on you? Until this day, is that your favorite era of music? Or, you know, truthfully, the rest of the band, yeah, they're sort of locked in that '60s '70s vibe. I literally, I'm not shitting. I I, I love pretty much anything if I can understand what the intention of the music is, you know, if it's a mashup and they're doing a couple of different things with it, I go, that's cool. That's fresh. My son took me to a rave, you know, the whole electronic music and I was watching everybody, you know, <laughs> completely out of it. Um, and I was going, no, that's no different than the love ins we had in the sixties and guitarists would be up there just jamming for 30, 40 minutes with these weird sounds was you know tripping on psychedelics and i went it's just another generation it's their music and you know what they love so it's very you know classical music jazz everything i really love and respect what i was very fortunate to be part of was that whole you know english rock and roll scene that was the beatles the stones the the kinks i mean all these bands and we were kids that you know, as young guys, what we wanted to do was obviously attract girls. What we saw was happening that if you had this, you know, <laughs> you and got a band, you were going to get a lot of girls and they would come to your shows and scream and yell. And so I got kicked out of seven high schools in the 60s for my hair. And my oh. hair was it just touched my ears. That's it. And it was like every week I was in there with the vice principal calling my parents saying this guy's a rebel, you know, and they kick out, go to the next one, you know, next high school. Yeah. But it was all about sort of, you know, I wanted to do that, that music. And that music was really from the South, you know, the R&B and blues that then migrated to Chicago. And then all these English acts started to do it. So then it was now acceptable to, you know, the white audience through these, you know, performers. But then they gave tribute to all those guys you know, who influenced them, which was great because they gave those guys, you know, a career and acknowledgement for creating some, you know, great, great music. So, I mean, I, mm. I, I, you know, the band we, as we have it now, we've been back together about 10 years now, is very much in that R&B bluesy style. Uh, I've got some punk in there as well. You know, uh, it's, it's all kind of stuff that has some sort of melodic quality to the to, to the actual melodies but just hard hard rock and roll i mean old school you know rock and roll i love it and, and real quick tom since we're talking about that now i'm so glad that the band and is going and the music's back where can the people hear the band what social platforms can we hear you and all that 
Um, well, you know, obviously we've been shut down. We had a whole tour of Texas and some other states in the South that all mm -hmm. went away. Um, there's word that things are going to start to open up maybe at the end of June. I mean, we'll all have to see because each state's going to be different, you know, with what happens. Um, but in terms of just kind of, if you want to just check out the band, there's a, we have a website, which is the Sloss. That's S L O T H S you know, like the cute little furry animals with the three toes, but, you know, floss, um, dot com. Um, I think it also is dot, no, yeah, dot com or the floss dot org, O-R-G. Um, you could go on there and there's a whole bunch of stuff. I think some, some of the music's on there, but YouTube is probably the best way to actually see our music videos, see people that you know, with cell cameras shot some of our shows live. Mm -hmm. Sounds not great because it's on a cell phone, but you kind of get a vibe of how crazy I am on stage and the kind of, you know, oh, I've seen <laughs> wild, crazy shit that, that I do, and which I shouldn't be doing at my age. But to me, I'm not my age. You know, I'm still no. a 15 year old kid, you know, <laughs> that's doing this shit, throwing myself into the audience, you know. Uh, Tom, this is why you, yeah. you know, it, this is. It's like sort of like the poor man's Alice Cooper in a way. This is see, this is why you are the the favorite director of all these movies. You just you you refuse to stop, and we absolutely love that about you. We think that's amazing, man. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Well, yeah, let's I mean, get it doesn't end until the coffin lid closes. I mean, and and even yeah. in my case, it's gonna go beyond that, which we can talk about at some point. <laughs> oh, we're gonna get there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Tom, let's let's get into this. I want to know how, you know, after we break through how you get into the movies and writing and stuff like that, I have some some fun questions. And I was doing some research on you. I found out, but how does a how does Tom get into? How does he break into Hollywood? Is it is it through writing? Is it through connections? How how does one like yourself get into that Hollywood system? It's pretty much what you guys all still can do and you actually have a much larger platform to do it in the digital age where you can put something you know on youtube or mo or anything or you know on your own facebook and if people see it and they then you know send it to somebody else you can start to kind of build your own audience um but we just you know we had the kind of write the scripts and then try to find somebody that would read them. And um, hopefully they might give you a break, but there was a, a lot of years where it was like, I was the guy who did a lot of movies because of my mind training that I was the monster in prophecy. <laughs> uh, I was the, the uh, Captain Star in the black hole. Um, I was the Jabberwocky in Alice in Wonderland. Constantly, I was getting these chances to actually be on somebody else's film and ask all the questions of all the crew, watch how they wasted money, watch how they saved money. And also I was able to get paid for doing a particular kind of skill. Um, and still that didn't mean shit in terms of you know, hey, the guy in the in the bear suit wants to direct one day. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I mean, it, it's the same stuff. You you know, you just have to you know keep pushing forward. And I wrote this script uh, based on an encounter that I had in the uh, catacombs in Paris. You know, with wall to wall skulls and bones, and really felt for the first time in my life that supernatural fear. And that was sort of what motivated me to write. Uh, one dark night about a, you know Meg Telly spending the night in the mausoleum, yes. and you know the corpses coming out and all that. But nobody you know in the seventies wanted to buy anything that was sort of like gothic horror. Friday hit, Halloween hit, and you know Prowler, you name it. It was all about get me somebody in a mask with a bag over his head or a you know some version of a leather face or and you know get a, give me a nice tool or something that you know you can kill women with and some isolated place you know and then you got a deal and I went I don't want to do that I it's not you know that's not kind of where I come from and stuff so I, you know it, it took a while before we finally found uh, this company that needed to basically lose a million dollars for a tax write-off. And they said, are you ready to shoot this in three weeks? And I went, you bet. I've got all the storyboards. I, you know, I've been preparing for five years for that day. And so three weeks after the, you know, the guy said, yeah, you know, we were shooting one dark night. And that was sort of, you know, the entry into it. 
but it didn't mean I got the next picture after that. I was dragging around those film cans. And in those days, you know, the big heavy ass film cans and you have to take it someplace where they have a projector and somebody has got to watch it and hopefully something, you know, will happen. And it didn't for, I said, you know, five, five years, I guess. Cause I did, I, we actually shot in 1981. I don't think it came out till 83. And then Friday was like, um, what, 86, I guess. Six. Six. So, yeah. So there was, there was, you know, a period there and it literally was, Frank Mancuso Jr. Um, saw my One Dark Night, and he was like really upset that the fans were very upset. It wasn't Jason in part five. And instead of waiting two years, as they normally did between the movies, he wanted to get the next one out one year afterwards. And he met with me, and I said, so well, what are you looking for? Because I, I don't want to just do a slasher, you know, just another one. And he's like, no, 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 no. You know, I, I see you've got some other direction that you go, all I want, dude, is bring Jason back from the dead. However you can do that, that's it. And, yeah, there's the face right there. Um, yeah, yeah. No, Tom, hold on. I, I hate to cut you off. I, I really hate to. I want to get there, but I, I still have – One Dark Night is one of my favorites, so I, I got to oh, ask really? a few more questions about that. Okay, sure, you sure. Know, Absolutely. And, and look, Tom, like a lot of people my age, you know, the I'm a young buck. I'm, I'm 29. A lot of people my age, we saw One Dark Night after – seeing this movie, right? Because yeah. we learned about it from you talking about it and stuff like that. And I love that movie so much. Can, can you talk, you know, there's the one, the, the Meg Tilly, she seems to be somebody that like, I wouldn't say she's eclectic in the horror world. I don't see a lot of, of, of interviews with her. I don't see a lot of press with her. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like working with Meg on that film? And really, yeah. how was that, was that a nerve-wracking experience for you? Or were you so ready and so confident in yourself that you 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 knew this oppor- what this opportunity was for you and you were just going to spearhead it right out of the gate? What was the mentality back then on all that? Well, I was certainly prepared. I certainly had every shot planned, everything that I wanted to do, but I really had no experience, you know, working with a crew. Um, the acting direct, the directing actors basically was like directing actors tapes, actors in, in you know, their audition tapes or whatever, and stage stuff. So I literally had to kind of figure out, okay, how can I get what I want from the actor and then also from the crew and, you know, deliver this in, which in those days was a short schedule, like 28 days, uh, no, 26 days it was. Um, and Meg, you know, was, I was looking for the kind of classic all American blonde girl to come in that looked like a girl, girl next door and all that. And the casting director brought in Meg Tilly. And at first I thought she was Asian and she does actually have, uh, an, I believe an Asian father. Um, and she had braces and her hair was all like in her face, but she kicked her hair up and started to do my shitty dialogue and like it came to life. And I went, oh my God, who is this girl? And she goes, well, she's done one thing in a movie called Tex with Matt Dillon where she played his girlfriend, but that's it. So One Dark Night literally was her you know, her first starring movie. And she was just great. She totally believed it, believed the circumstances, freaked herself out by being in the mausoleum. And I tried to get the other girls to also be you know, to kind of enjoy the fun of it. And then of course, you know, the terror takes off. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, there was like the day that we actually shot at the real cemetery with the real mausoleum, you know, I had to do 60 shots with the single in one day, you know, starting when the sun came up, you know, we use that for the sunset shot in the movie. And then once it got into night, it was all the stuff where the boyfriend's trying to sneak in. So it was a hell of a day to, you know, to try to do 60 shots in one day, but you know, we did it. And the whole movie was sort of that, you know, you know, go for it. And I wanted, I knew it, I didn't have any blood in it. The, the company that uh, funded the thing were Mormon. They didn't want any, you know, Jesus Christ or anything referenced in that regard. So there couldn't be, you know, any profanity. And then I just didn't, just, just didn't call for sex in the movie. There was nothing that, you know, really. So we ended up getting a PG, which I did not want. You know, I thought, oh, this is going to be lame. You know, people are, you know, going to think there's nothing cool in this movie. It's PG. But what happened was parents, grandparents took their kids who saw the, you know, the commercial on TV 
to go see One Dark Night because it was PG and it scared the shit out of them. I mean, <laughs> I've, I've met these people over the years going, you know, you fucked up my childhood, man. You know, it was like I was under a bed for like a week, you know, with the, you know, I didn't know what that was going to happen, you know, and, and of course I didn't realize it was going to have that kind of effect either. So it, over the years, it kind of took on this strange cult status and the PG sort of became a, a blessing, you know, in, in that regard. Um, but it, it was a show that we really all, everybody really, you know, put everything into. And it, you know, it, it took two years before it was re released because the company did go bankrupt and it opened and closed in about a week and then kind of disappeared and, you know, obviously now reappeared. And, and 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 Tom, can we talk about can we talk about a few things like what is it like as a as be becoming a filmmaker such as yourself and working your ass off to make this film and doing a fantastic job? What is it like? How agonizing? How agonizing is it to have to wait to see your film released? You know, it's it's really it, it's hard, of course because it's like, it's like your baby. And at one point somebody took over the company and recut the, you know, we, we came to the editing room on a Monday morning and it was cleared out. All the film was gone. Everything was gone. I had no idea. This guy took it up to Utah. They said, you know, you know, I've taken over the company now. I'm going to, you know, do this cut the way I want it. And thank God he didn't change it extremely, but he did enough stuff that it, certainly messed with my mind. And, you know, years later, I began to appreciate how many really good filmmakers lost their stuff. Like, you know, George Lucas with THX, you know, he, that was not what George wanted to do with that movie, the way it came out. Um, and uh, Nick Castle, who was the shape in Halloween, uh, he had this great script about Peter Pan as an adult going back to Neverland and this whole thing with his kids and stuff. And he thought he had a go deal and then suddenly it, it, you know, stopped. And a couple of years later up comes hook, you know, with Steven Spielberg. And it, was it a, a coincidence? I don't know, but you know, for Nick, that was a, certainly a hard break, but these yeah. kinds of things happen where if you're not, you know, really powerful, you don't have clout, you're going to have to deal with some of those, everybody wanting to piss on the tree to mark their territory like an animal. And we saw a preview of the movie and the ending was just like, it was like a non ending. And we begged Panavision to give us cameras and we paid for the film and we reconstructed uh, a part of the set in my backyard. And we shot that ending with the girls and the bodies and the, you know, the head dropping in and the tooth, brush. That little thing was all shot in my backyard because at least it gave the audience some sort of laugh, you know, thing to go out on. And all of us were doing or tr trying to do the end of Carrie. I mean, that was like, if you saw that in the theater, when that moment happened, she comes up and grabs, you know, Amy Irving's, you know, I mean, that the theater, man, I'm telling you, everybody was up out of their seats. Right. So, and yeah, it was incredible. So you cannot deny those influences is happening in us filmmakers. It's like, yeah, how do we do a version of something like that? So that was sort of, you know, my way of at least having some sort of great note. And how sick are we all about every trailer that the trailer ends and then if you get the credits and then it's like, boom, you know, there's gotta be one more image and one more something. And that's really become a cliche, but it's like, we gotta like slam one more thing out there to get them to go, yeah, I gotta go see this. But those, yeah. that's, these are the different, you know, cliches that become, stuff that it's sort of expected, you know, by the audience. And when somebody comes along and does something, you know, really new, um, you know, Dan Merrick, who did Blair Witch, uh, who I'm working with right now on a, on a new series. Um, which is, yeah, we'll talk about that too. But I mean, what he did, you know, kind of tripping into that whole thing of giving the actors the cameras and, you know, having them do that revolutionized horror, the whole found footage thing if it wasn't for Blair Witch, that would have never happened. And they had no idea that thing was going to take off the way it did. So, mm. like, if you want to be, you know, a filmmaker and you want to do horror, you got to, you know, somehow be brave enough to try something else and hope, you know, it gets seen and people go, yeah, that's cool. I haven't seen it done quite like that. Mm. Yeah. You know, you know, Tom, I want to ask you this real quick, too. You know, all these years later with One Dark Night and the fan base that it's gotten, 
I mean, is that's got to be a gratifying thing now, right? Because oh, yeah. we got that nice Blu-ray. I've got the Blu-ray. I forgot. I think it was Code Red. I could be wrong, but I think it was Code Red that put it out, and it's a yeah. great release. How how important is that to you that this film has – it just seemingly – it just keeps going up and up, and it's just gaining more fans and fans? It Well, it's that thing that everybody – you know, everybody wants to make something and then be, you know, the local hero, the national hero, the number one at the box office and all that stuff. And that happens like maybe this amount of the time for anybody. Mm-hmm. And then the backside of that is you make something and it's huge and it's like, okay, what are you doing next? Come on, blow us away again. Mm-hmm. You can't do it. I mean, it's it's just like next to impossible to make an incredible sequel that, lives up to the first one unless you try to like you know change up the rules in some way Uh, i mean i gotta say still to this day francis ford coppola doing the second godfather so many people say i kind of almost like that one better than the first one and other ones go no it's not it's never going to be like the first one but damn he did you know that flash back and forth it gave us the godfather but it gave us in a completely different way but as you know with horror movies it's like you know well what worked last time, you know, well, let's see if we could just do that same thing again. And the fans are like, yeah, we've seen that, you know, do something else. But if you do mm-hmm. something too different, the famous, you know, Halloween three, you know, it, you know, John Carpenter thought, you know, well, let's do it in a different way and don't, you know, don't have Michael Myers in there. Nobody was happy about that. <laughs> they wanted to see it. And, you know, I, I thought he did a, you know, Tommy Wallace did a good job with that. There's a lot of great things in Halloween three, but the expectation factor was, you know, we, we want to see the man, you know? Right. So, you know, th- those are the, you know, the flip side things that can happen. But when things happen so much later, for instance, Friday's the same thing. I mean, I'll tell you guys, I'm so appreciative of everybody 35 years later, the fan base is far beyond anything I ever expected. The amount of, you know, mail I get, emails I get, people, you know, wanting to be Facebook friends, going to these conventions, people are like, you know, that movie changed my life. What do you mean changed your life? It's like my dad passed away that, you know, that summer and I saw that and it just, you know, it, you know, that just became everything to me. You know, have you watched it since then? Oh yeah, like a hundred times, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's a, an amazing thing because all of us guys, in, in the 80s, we thought we were doing shit. We thought like the, sh- the really good stuff was done in the 70s. We're just getting paychecks. We're making sequels. You know, there'd occasionally there'd be something that was kind of cool. But we never in a million years thought that Michael Myers, Jason, Leatherface, Chucky, you know, all these pinhead, all these monsters that were part of that age would be for the next generations what Frankenstein, Dracula, the Wolfman, all those monsters, you know, were to us growing up. So it's an incredible blessing, you know, when people come up and the, you know, their six-year-old kids got a Jason mask on and a, a plastic <laughs> machete, and I'm going, holy shit, I never would have <laughs> something like that would happen. But the kids are not freaked out by it. It's just something they, they grew just, up with. They're cool. Yeah. You know, Tom, I want to ask you. I want to ask you this now, and I just want to say, every everybody watching, we have a very lively chat. You guys, I of course, I am not going to just do the show and not let you guys ask Tom questions. Of course, you're just as much a part of this as I am. I'm going to ask Tom a couple more questions, and then as long as Tom, as Tom is cool with it, uh, you guys can ask away, and Tom will will answer. So, Tom, I want to ask you this. You know. I'll never forget, you know, I, I'm the kind of person, I'm very inquisitive and I like to know, you know, how people think about this or that when they, when they say something. I'm watching, of course, the multiple Jason Friday the 13th documentaries you've done. And mm-hmm. you said that when you got the gig, you went, I believe you said you were at Paramount Studios, right? And you binged all the Fridays yeah. up until where yeah. we were. No. I'm, I'm curious about this, Tom. At that time, and even now, you can you can give me both if you can. When you binged all those movies in a row, what did you think? Did were there certain standouts that you liked, and were there other ones that you were like, that didn't really hit it for me? We can do a little bit better than that. You know what I mean? Like, what was your impression after watching all of those well, first five? For the reasons that I gave earlier about how we were all you know really pressured to come up with you know slasher movies at that time. I didn't really follow, you know, the Friday track at all. Um, So I saw the first one, which I thought was amazing because it was such a great twist that it was the mother. 
Tom Tavini's effects were like, holy shit, you can show that kind of stuff. So it was a great, you know, shock and and really well done. Um, when I kind of heard that the the second one was, well, yeah, this guy's now suddenly grown up and he's got he's like the elephant man over his head. And yeah, I don't know. It's not the first, you know, I ended up not going um, for no snobbish reason. I just, nobody told me it was like, you got to go see this. So when I sat down, you know, I saw the first one, which I still liked a lot. You know, the second one, I found merits in there. The third one with the 3D stuff was great in the introduction of the mask. And then when I got to the fourth one, I, you know, which was supposed to have been the final chapter, I went, Joe, Joe Zito made a really good movie here. I mean, it's like, I like the characters, you know, Jason was great. I thought all that, and it, you know, as far as I was concerned, you know, it should have ended there as they intended. But that thing made so much fucking money. It was like, no, we got to keep it going. And uh, well, yeah. we killed Jason. What do we do? Well, we'll have somebody. Everybody will think it's Jason. And then at the end, you know, Tommy will put the mask up, and you know, people think, oh, Tommy will be the next one. And most of the fans were not happy about that, mm -hmm. which is, you know, obviously when I was asked to come in and do it. But I looked at, I, I was looking for a mythology. I was looking for something that I could kind of, you know, tie this up in the kind of classic thing that was in the, uh, which one was that, where they sat around the fire and, and talked about the history of Jason, you know, just that kind of classic campfire, you know, story. And, you know, I did that when the, when the uh, counselors arrived in the kitchen and she kind of gave them this backstory that was all just, you know, a myth, you know, and this is something that, you know, we now scare each other with, ooh, Jason's out there. And then of course, you know, the real thing you know, ends up happening. So I used kind of all the other movies to say, okay, they did this, I wanna try that. They did this, let me try this. And the main thing is I wanted Jason, since I brought him back like Frankenstein, there's no two ways about where I stole that. Um, the, the fact is now he's really unstoppable. You know, and that, you know, he, if, if he's going to fall, he's going to kind of play possum, you know, if nothing else, it really doesn't hurt him. So I thought if he's got that much strength, he can twist a head and pull it off. He can punch out a heart. You know, he can do all these things that are not imitation, you know, that you cannot imitate um, because there was a huge backlash, as probably a lot of you know, that a lot of people watch those movies. And then when they did some horrible act, they go, yeah, I thought it was Jason or yeah, I thought it was Mike Myers. And, you know, so there was this huge uproar, you know, same thing with the music, you know, that the music was, you know, causing the youth of America to, you know, do all these evil things. And it's like, no, you know, music doesn't cause it. Some people have a, a fire and sometimes that, you know, those movies certainly is a gasoline that somehow makes it okay. but having done movies about real serial killers and real monsters like AIDS and global warming and, and, you know, segregation and all these other real life monsters, that to me is far more scary than the kind of monsters that we were making back in the day, because to me, they were fun and you could sort of identify with them because you didn't have that same strength. You couldn't do that, you know, and that, that had kind of a, that, that villain hero, you know, aspect to it until finally, you know, people are on Jason's side, you know, through these things, um, yeah. which made it a little harder, you know, to be scary with it. So he went to outer space, you know, he went to Manhattan, he went to hell, you know, kept trying to find different things to do with this, you know, this guy. Yeah. And, you know, Tom, when you, when you, when you got started on this project, you know, we hear all the time, you know, of course, you know, everybody, you know, all of us fans, we 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 know we 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 learn so much. We all feel like we're experts, and everybody, you know, you know, thinks they know everything about Friday the Thirteenth and this and that. And everybody says, you know, oh yeah, oh yeah, Paramount, they they hated Friday the Thirteenth, blah blah blah. They hated it. They're embarrassed about it. That's like what the word is on everything. You hear it in these documentaries and stuff. No, you were talking obviously with, for lack of a better term, Paramount. You're, you're yeah. dealing with these people. How true is that? How was it really like a thing like, ah, yeah, Tom, we're going to make another one, man. But, you know, blah, blah, blah. or was it like, hey, we're do was it an exciting thing for the company and with Frank? Like, what was the real, 
what was the real mood like about those films at that time, especially when when you came in and like for you, it was a ride or die film. Like you had to save that franchise. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what they were hoping. But I think at that point it was sort of like, well, if we can at least bring him back, you know, maybe the franchise can continue. But I literally wrote and directed it. If this was it, then I did what I thought was right. Put the boy back in the lake and leave him there, you know. And if somebody goes scuba diving and finds him and I didn't I didn't know where I was going to go next. But I felt like I wanted to kind of end it on that on that note and also introduce Jason's father, which I wasn't able to do because Frank Mancuso said, if we put Jason's father in there and the fans think, ah, the next movie is going to be about Jason's dad, you know, it was like, no, we can't do that. So, you know, we're going to take that out. Now, of course, they're making, you know, these movies, Vengeance, which has C.J. Graham playing Jason's father. And of course, you know, I get to make these cameos and the they, so I, I'm happy because they asked me permission to do the Jason's father thing. And, you know, it, it was one thing that I didn't get to do that I wished I had. But in terms of Paramount and all these companies, they, you know, all these things were done under different titles. We, mm -hmm. you know, we shot Aladdin Sane. Everything was a, you know, for Frank, uh, a David Bowie album. And, oh, yeah. and we couldn't shoot in town because the unions would find out. And it was like Paramount. It's like, oh, no, those guys got money. But we were really working on very, very low budgets. And we kind of had to hide. We shot in Georgia, you know, under this Aladdin Sane name. And most of them were like that. So there was a kind of embarrassment that we're, you know, we're making really good money at this. But we don't want to sit there and go, yeah, we're Paramount that does, you know, Friday the 13th because they're investors or whoever's involved, you know, the, the, the studio has those connections with corporations and stuff. They didn't make a big deal about it. But once the movie came out and it did well, yeah, you know, everybody was more than happy to say they did it. Um, but there was that kind of, all right, we're doing this kind of under the radar and the hope is, you know, it does well and the studio is going to be happy. And thank God, Frank Mancuso's father, Frank Sr., ran the studio when he came and saw the midnight screening in Westwood that we had the first night and he came over to me and he was just nodding, shook my hand. I thought, OK, that's great. The head of the studio of Paramount loves the movie. And he introduced me to Dino De Laurentiis at a party. And the next thing I did was uh, this movie I've been carrying around for years, Date with an Angel. And then Dino had me do the Stephen King movie. Sometimes they come back. But if it wasn't for the head of the studio making that introduction, you know, that wouldn't have happened. So it's all, it, it's like, even when people say they're not really crazy about something, secretly, it's like, you know, this is a, you know, breadwinner for us. So let's, let's not try to fuck up the franchise. Let's see if we can keep yeah. it going. You know, Tom, were there any, obviously, you know, with your Friday, your ending specifically, Jason being in the lake, that was the initial idea that you had, correct, for mm -hmm. him? Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, I would assume if you try to do these these bizarre endings, you would have got you know some pushback on that. Do you remember mandate wise from the start what they told you you could not do? Because I know that you said you wanted to have your sense of humor, which is brilliant, and I still don't think you get enough credit in terms of that aspect because you know a lot of people give that to Scream. I think that you predated it well before that. Now people are talking about it, but still, it's not it's not preached about enough, but. Do you remember any mandates at the first point of what what you were you were told like you cannot do this you cannot do that? Okay, good question. Um, I got to answer the one about uh, Scream because year a few years after I did uh, you know my Friday the Thirteenth, I didn't want to keep doing franchises, so I turned down Bride of Chucky, and I was sent the script called Scary Movie, um, and I read it and I went. This is so close to my kind of satire. Uh, what else we got? And then about four months later, you know, I all the shit scripts I read, I went, you know, I kind of like that scary movie. You know, that uh, who's that guy? Uh, Kevin Williamson, I think. Williamson. You know, it's like yeah, too late, Tom. You snooze, you lose. Wes Craven's doing it. And I went, okay. I never thought it was going to become the franchise that it did, but there is justice. Years later. I went, I was set up with a meeting with Kevin Williamson for some new series that he was doing. And towards the end of the meeting, he went, you know what? 
I got to tell you this because I think you'd appreciate it. Your Friday the 13th had such an impact on that first script of mine. And, you know, I got I got to give you kudos for that. And I was just, OK, well, I I turned down scary movie. So I feel like a complete jerk. But thank you for that, at least, because, you know, that means a lot. Uh, but, yeah, I was just from Paramount standpoint, they were nervous about the humor. They wanted to make sure I didn't make fun of Jason. I said, no, I'm a horror guy. I still want to make a horror movie, but I just want to have the characters be likable and have a sense of humor. I wanted people from the get go with the James Bond thing to go, okay, you know, this is the sixth one, you know, other than James Bond, there hadn't been anything that had gone on this long. So I wanted to put a little tongue in cheek on that. And then just, you know, some of the kills and some of the moments, the happy face on the tree, whatever, it, you know, they were fine. And the only thing, the really, the only marching orders was bring back Jason and got to cut out Jason's father, you know, and that was it. I had so much control. It was ridiculous and something that most people, you know, you, you never get that. But he trusted me. He I was in a great place at a great time where it's like, you know, we, we don't know what to do next. Can you figure it out? And it's like, I can do my best. I didn't know. And I was literally, guys, I was scared to death that the fans would hate that I put humor into it. The hate that it wasn't going to be as nasty, you know, as the, as part five was, because they had some nasty shit in it. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot more that was cut out. Um, and what I did do is every kill, I shot sort of like three versions of it. Uh, if I thought there was going to be problems with the MPAA, um, but I knew some of the things were going to be intense and I knew that they were going to object to it, but I didn't think they were going to object to it nine times and make us keep taking out tiny little frames, you know, picking on the back bend of the sheriff. That was like a huge deal that we couldn't show that, you know, two more times, you know, going from him being bent back and Jason coming up, you know, um, you know, when the uh, cop gets his head squished, you know, I had this great effect with his skull breaking open a piece of his brain, you know, coming up, you know, the triple decapitation, these guys rigged this great thing where you saw the machete go through and all three heads dropped, you know, we lost that. So there's a lot of things that were really well done. And to me, they were so over the top, come on, it's not going to make anybody go out and do that. But they had a real, you know, boner about, you know, you guys are corrupting people and we're going to make you, you know, water it down and water it down as much as possible. So I had to kind of go in with that knowledge that this could happen. Um, I didn't expect it to be nine times, though. No, no Tom, I got to ask you this. And guys, we're getting to the questions. I, I, I've, we've already gone 40 minutes. I don't want to keep Tom too, too long. And I want to get to the, the – we got 70 people in here, Tom. Just just ask fire and away questions. Okay, um, I'm good. I want to ask you this, Tom. Yeah. So the Friday the 13th box set from Scream Factory comes out, and everybody's losing their mind because they found some of that footage from part two. And you got mm -hmm. to see these kills. Tom, is there a director's cut of Jason Lives that we haven't seen that we could possibly see someday? Or oh, you give me the no. No, no, you know, because back in the day, guys, when the motion picture rating board would come in and make us do cuts, we, you know, you would trim pieces of you know the plastic celluloid film off and would go in some box. Where those boxes are, nobody seems to know. We don't know if it was like, you know, just thrown away at some point because they just thought these movies you know, were, you know, trash. Uh, you know, it's like, why do we keep this? this? Isn't anything historic or or what happened, you know, to it? Is it going to show up one day? I don't know. I mean, the best thing that I found was we made a videotape of one of our cuts early on. And that's on, you know, one of one of the supplemental, uh, you know, additions. Uh, I can't remember which one it was, but, you know, that at least shows you some of this stuff. But in terms of like a definitive uh, version, I really didn't have a whole lot that was taken away. It was little small bits and pieces, which I would love to have back in. And of course, certainly the fans would love to have it back in. But nobody seems to know where that uh, those little pieces of plastic are. Breaks my heart. Okay, Tom. One more question, then we're gonna get to the the, the fans because they're I can't I can't even keep up with it. Let's talk about today, Tom. I'm very excited with everything you got going on today. I I really don't even even know where to start. Can you just tell me what is Tom's daily life right right now? What are you working on? Okay, uh, 
Well, a couple of things. One thing a lot of you know, and if you saw, if you've got the box set, which I love, I went nuts, you know, when I heard what they were doing and all the stuff they put in there. I mean, uh -huh. just, you know, you watch that stuff for a half a year, you know, all the commentaries and stuff to see it yeah. all. But anyway, um, in there, I talk about uh, Jason Never Dies, which is, you know, finally I wrote a sequel. It only took me 32 years to come up with something that I went, you know what, I'm sitting in a theater, I'm watching the Jason movie, what do I wanna see after all these years, after all these, you know, meeting the fans and talking about them and what they love about the different ones. So I went in going, okay, first off, I wanna stay in his territory. I want it to be around Crystal Lake and that, but what if we did it in the winter? What if for the first time we saw Jason in heavy snow, you know, Tragic, and when somebody runs, they're leaving a trail. He's got, he knows what to do, and they try to do you know things to try to throw him off. But it's a it's literally in the winter. Well, it's not a summer camp, of course. So, being an ex Catholic boy, I went. You know, they used to Me have too. retreats, and you know, if you were bad, you know, you would go on one of these spiritual retreats, and they take you to some camp someplace. And you would stay there. In this case, it was like for the Thanksgiving weekend. So there's one hard ass Irish nun and six badass girls, you know, who bring up drugs, who get in fights, who one of them's pregnant. I mean, there's just they, each one of them has like a history of sin behind them. And they're there to be supposedly, you know, spiritually uplifted and can go back so that they can graduate, you know, high school. Um, because they've, you know, they've made amends. So Jason is going to be confronting all women. Um, this is not oh anything I'm trying to do for the Me Too generation. I went, no, I love the fact that this group of women is there because that's what would happen. It wouldn't be boys and girls on a spiritual retreat. They, you know, they all get cabins, the girls board together. So I tried to come up with something that would be fresh within the thing, bringing back Jason in probably one of the most expensive, spectacular fashions that I hope is still logical, it is for me, and giving a, a, another agenda for him rather than he's just killing to kill, which is what I did with Jason Lives. Tommy brought him back. Jason is pissed off. As far as I was concerned, the dude was happy laying there, you know, resting in peace. This asshole brings him back, so he's got to go after Tommy. Anybody in his way goes down, you know, which is Jason's MO. And Tommy has an agenda. We got to stop. First, they got to believe me that's Jason. Now we got to stop him. How the hell are we going to do that? I just old ghost thing, you know, you like poltergeist, you know, you, you move the tombstones, you didn't move the bodies, you know. He's got to go back to where he died, you know, and me, Tommy had to figure out some way to get him back down to the bottom of Crystal Lake. So there was closure. So for this one, I tried to do the same thing, have an element that was actually introduced in Jason Lives that a lot of people will go, oh, shit, that's what that is. And so it will tie that together for the fans. But if you've never even seen a Friday the 13th, I wanted to deliver just a great horror movie with a great, you know, unstoppable monster and some kick-ass girls that are in there, you know, if they're going to go down, they're going to go down fighting. So that was kind of the direction that I went. But as everybody knows, Cunningham and, and um, uh, what's his name? <laughs> Blanking on the writer's name. Um, uh, yeah. Darn, what's his name? You guys know. Now, uh, now you got me blanking. Um, uh, the chat's going to tell us. Um, somebody tell me quick because I feel embarrassed because I. <laughs> you I'm got me? With, I'm friends with both of these guys. And somehow, you know, age is a horrible thing, guys. You know, the mind just psh, sometimes. Um, Walter, no. No, it's, it's not. It's uh, no. Victor Miller. Victor Miller. Thank you, guys. <laughs> See, you're wrong. You're wrong, Kirkin. These guys know more about Friday than me, you, anybody. I mean, yeah, they know. They tell me what I did, and I go, "Did I? Oh, I guess so." Yeah. I have an excuse though. I'm nervous because I'm talking to royalty. So <laughs> hardly. Um, but you know, so that's I, I've got that going. I've also written a couple of other uh, horror pieces with kind of a, a new type of villain. 
um, that I, again, trying to come up with something that we've seen, but not quite like this. And then I had a, you know, a wonderful um, introduction to Dan Merrick, um, who has created a series on, you know, basically gothic horror stories, all things that would take place in the South, all things that would have that vibe of that, you know, that Southern Gothic feel, you know, that, you know, the, you know, the, the weeping willows, you know, and, and the, you know, all that vibe. And, you know, um, Jeremy, Jeremy Reddick, who uh, created the uh, Final Destination series, he's a part of it too. And there's a lot of, you know, just really cool directors who are writing these half hour episodes that, you know, are gonna be put into this, this series called the Black Veil. And uh, so I've already written mine and we start production um, next month at the end of May. Excellent. Uh, you know, heading down to Tampa, Florida. So if anybody's around, you know, drop by. I, I always love, you know, see people, meet people. So yeah. we're, gonna, we're gonna be looking, and we are in the middle of looking for a plantation house, you know, for this kind of classic, you know, location where this is gonna occur. And it, actually touches upon something very real in our world right now, as well as, you know, a, just a classic Southern Gothic, I don't want to say it's a ghost story, but it's, it's, it's horrific, almost in the one dark night vein in a little, in a little way, but uh -huh. um, I, I think people are going to enjoy it in, in, in terms of taking a real issue that's going on in our world in, in a whole different context of how, how it gets handled. So uh, that that's the next thing that's actually up. Um, and then, you know, it's like I teach, you know, I've been teaching at Chapman University, trying to encourage, you know, the next generation of filmmakers to come up with stuff that's personal, things that they love, influences that they love, put it in there. Don't worry about somebody saying you're stealing because nobody, anybody who's ever been great has stolen whether it's Mozart or, you know, the great painters or, you know, you have inspirations, you steal their shit and you make it your own. It's just the way it is. You can look at every movie and go, oh, I know where he got that. I know where he got that. But everybody wants to come up with something totally original. And it's, it's really hard. It, you really have to borrow from other things and somehow make it, make it work, make it your own. And, yes. you know, that's what is enjoyable kind of working with, you know, 18 to, you know, 22 year old, young filmmakers and a yeah. lot of women filmmakers now too, you know, which That's is great. great. Well, Tom, I'll say this before we get to these questions. I, I know I speak for everybody watching the show and everybody that watches this after the fact, we're so glad to see you that you're just doing great and you're still working hard. Don't give up on us. Cause I promise we will not give up on you ever. Thank you. So, okay, Tom, the fans are ready to ask you a bunch of questions and we've got one right here from Nathan. Thanks for that $5 super chat. He says, was it an accident or a conscious choice that there was no nudity? <laughs> That's probably one of the biggest questions that comes up here. Here's the deal. Um, in the script, she is naked. She has her top off, you know, it's a, and we definitely, you know, see, see the hardware there on the day when we were shooting it, I said to Darcy, because I love and respect women and I love and respect actors and actresses, I said, are you okay, you know, doing this? And she goes, you know, I didn't sign that waiver with SAG, um, to, you know, to do this. So I'm not terribly comfortable about doing it. If you, unless, I mean, unless you're going to want to force me. And I said, I'm not going to force you. No. And as far as I'm concerned, there was so much nudity in part five. Look, We'll take court shirt off. You know, you get on top of him and just ride the hell out of him. As far as I'm concerned, that that'll be fine. But I've had so so much blowback over why did you choose that? And I, and I, I was trying to be respectful to the actress. And then, kind of, as the years have gone on, I went, well, that's another thing that makes it different. And this is sort of like the you know the beginning. Of, you know, what do they call that? The uh, you know, the, the first time you get introduced to drugs, you know, the entry drug, you know, my Friday is like gateway. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, the gateway drug. Right. So my Friday has been over the years. Well, if you don't want to see this and this, watch this one first, because this is more like a movie and you know, it's, it's more fun and it's got humor and stuff. And then people will start watching all the other ones. So somehow those little 
touches that sometimes were not intended, you know, ended up kind of, you know, being a backwards, you know, compliment. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I see a question that you already did answer. You were the mutant bear. You played part of the mutant bear in the prophecy, correct? Yeah, Did you yeah, share that with somebody? Hall. Kevin Peter Hall, who went on obviously do Predator and things. Uh, yeah, he was in this huge suit and which didn't have any articulation where I had 150 pounds of mechanics, hydraulics and all this shit on my head. I had to learn how to run on all fours. With <laughs> it was three months of like, you know, trying to be Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, to be inside of this costume. And it was, I mean, it was hard. Sean Frank and I remember having me running through fire and doing all this stuff, you know, and then Kevin had the huge one that they would use for like when he, you know, smacked the, the car and knocked it over and stuff. But I got to be really good friends with Kevin and he was, I mean, it was a huge loss when we lost him you know he was the nicest guy in the world and it was so great going places with him and he's seven two you know <laughs> and he has to duck every time he goes into some place but he was so cool about it and you know he was he was such a sweetheart of a guy yeah. but um yeah that it was fun you know for that reason frankenheimer was a madman you know making this movie but i learned a lot about directing you know by being on set Oh, we got another one right here, Tom. They say, were, were Cheech and Chong supposed to be in Jason Lives? No. Uh, what happened? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. When I finished with mine and it was, you know, actually got good reviews, you know, they said, well, it's that same shit. They got to kill all that, this body count. But it does have a sense of humor. You can't hate something that's, you know, making fun of itself. It's even talking right to the audience as well as a filmmaker saying some folks have a strange idea of entertainment. So we actually got like somehow encouraging reviews with it. So Frank came to me and he said, let's talk about the next one. I said, the next one? He goes, yeah, what do you got? I will, I got nothing. I, I put everything I knew in that. And if you want to go do Jason's father, no, we don't want to do that. And I said, have you got an idea? He goes, yeah. Jason meets Freddy. I said, how the fuck are you going to do that? He's with New Line. This is Paramount. That's not going to happen. He goes, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Oh, so boy. about a week later, he called me. He went, eh, those guys, no, they're not going to give it up and stuff. Uh, but I still want to make a sequel or something you know, with you. And out of the top of my head, I went, how about Cheech and Chong meet Jason? He goes, what? And I go, you know, Abbott and Costello met Frankenstein. Why not have these stoners up there? I mean, I don't know if they're camp counselors or if they're out camping. And it's like, hey, man, you hear about that Jason dude? Yeah. You know, and he goes, <laughs> and he laughed his ass off. But he said, I don't know. I think the Cheech and Chong audience and the Jason audience are two different things. I go, no, we all smoke the same weed. I mean, this <laughs> is to get stoned and see a Jason movie. I mean, we did the preview. Everybody was toasted beyond belief. You know, you heard the beer bottles rolling down the aisle and stuff. Same audience. He goes, eh, it just doesn't seem right. So when I finally revealed this, I don't know, maybe like a year ago, and it you know, kind of went in, you know, I guess bloody disgusting in some of the other sites, suddenly Teach and Chong announced that they might do a horror movie. And I don't know if it was spun off from that. Obviously, they can't do Jason. None of us can, as long as the, you know, the lawsuit continues. But what's that thing where it's like my name and Cheech and Chong sort of, you know, came together because I had this, you know, crazy idea of, of, of doing a, you know, stoner comedy and Jason movie. Here we are getting down to the truth, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let's see. I had a good question from uh, my friend Nico real quick. I'll get to that $5 super chat next. I'm so sorry. Nico says, Tom, can you talk about the differences in working on Friday 6 and also the, the television series, both writing and directing? Uh, yeah, huge difference. Um, when Frank told me, look, I'm going to do a series on Friday the 13th. I mean, I said, well, you're doing a series. He goes, no, 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 television series. I have Jason every week. No, no, we're going to have this, you know, this uh, antique shop with cursed things. And every week, the people that run the camp, you know, the shop are going to have to hunt down the cursed objects and things. I said, aren't the fans going to be pissed off? You call it Friday the 13th and there's no Jason. We're going to call it, you know, Friday's curse, I think, which is what they called it in Canada. Um, right. And but <laughs> here, you know, Paramount knew they had something that people would come and see if it was called Friday the 13th. So it sort of built up its own following. And Frank had me on 
as a story editor and then, you know, wanted me to, you know, direct and write some episodes. And, you know, the Playhouse was one of the ones uh, that I was very proud of because I had just had children and I felt there was something about missing children and where do they go, you know, and they're never seen again. And I thought, what if kids had this playhouse that I had looked like, you know, Norman Bates's house from Psycho miniature and they would abduct them into there and mm. they would get this power. They could do anything they wanted when they were in their playhouse and had an abusive mother and stuff. So it was, again, kind of mixing two different things, you know, reality monsters, you know, and this fantasy that these kids could do. Uh, and then I did, uh, you know, the opening of the third season, um, which, I, you know, he said, give me something that has like an exorcist thing. And we got to kill Ryan, the character of Ryan, but we can't really kill him. You know, wants to leave the show and do something else. As far as I'm concerned, the next job he's going to do is going to be, do you want fries with that? And he, but he thinks he's going to go off and do it. And he, he did do a Friday movie. He did do some other things. John's a great guy. And you know, he did what he thought was right for his career, but they had to, you know, introduce this new character and that move, the thing I did, the two-parter, you know, had to do that. But it was a whole different thing, obviously, being in, in Canada, having a Canadian crew who were great, really hard workers, really dedicated. And we cranked these things out 18 hours every night. I mean, it was insane. We couldn't do that down here. The unions would shut you down. But up mm -hmm. there, they were like, sure, okay. And so we really did a lot of a lot of stuff that would have been impossible in LA. Uh, but the you know, Canadian crews were were just really super. Right. Excellent. So here we got one. Thank you for the five dollar super chat. Blood Red Skies. He asks, What was your reaction when Jason Lives was first released and you were seeing how much money it made first week at the box office? Well, we have the wonderful reputation of being, I guess, one of the, I guess maybe the only one, I don't know. I, I kind of forgot what happened after ours, uh, what they did. But at that time, we came in number two at the box office, not number one. Number one was Aliens, you know, Jim Cameron's Aliens, which came out the week before. So, you know, if I would do the same thing. You know, you haven't seen Aliens? Let's go. You know, I saw it last weekend. Let's go. So you know, what about the Friday the 13th? Nah, it's not even going to be Jason. Fuck that. Let's go. You know, <laughs> so the box office did suffer and we came in, you know, number two. So, you know, they were like, yay, you know, well, it's number two, but it wasn't number one. So I felt sort of bad about that, but there was like nothing I could do. I tried to deliver the best Friday I could. And as the years have gone on, you know, it, it, you know, I'm so honored for so many people. It's, you know, it's been their favorite. Um, as I said, you know, when they asked me, I said, part four, you know, you don't like yours? Oh, yeah, I like mine because I did it. But if you want to ask me the Friday that, I, you know, that I thought was a good one out of the series, you know, part four was. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the, the thing. And, you know, it, it did, as the years went on, obviously, you know, the VHSs, the laser discs, the Blu-rays, you know, streaming now, you know, it continues to be, you know, a, a gold mine. All the movies do for those guys. So. Oh, yeah. Okay, we got uh, Wendigo and the Nightmare. Thank you for that $2. It says, was part six made to watch in black and white like a monster movie? That's cool. You remember that. That's great. Yes. I love, you know, the classic black and white horror movies, as you've heard you know the universal ones and all that and there was something that in fact i i think it was george lucas that, that i learned this from two things watch the movie with the sound completely off and see if you can follow the story because it's all visual and make it look black and white and if it looks good in black and white it's going to look great in color too because it has those contrasts so I literally, as we were doing it, and in those days, the monitor that you looked at was in black and white. You know, there were no color monitors, you know, and most of the time I wasn't even around it. I was, you know, by the camera, you know, watching the, the actors. But, you know, when we would, uh, we would screen it and when we made a video copy of it, we would play it back lots of times in black and white and see if we can make, tweak it in the color timing and stuff to make it as contrasty as we could. So it did look cool 
in black and white as well. So it, yeah, it was a, a kind of a conscious thing that obviously I knew we couldn't release it that way, like Parasite did. <laughs> you know, you, you had the power to say, well, we're going to put out a blue version of Parasite. Uh, but, you know, obviously we, we couldn't do that. But yeah, if you get a chance, watch it sometime. Take, take the color out and just watch it. And it, it works kind of on a slightly different level. You know, it feels mm, more. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Tom, let's see. Uh, okay. We got a question from Brock, and he want, he. this is what he asked, but I'm going to kind of ask this so you can elaborate a little bit more. He said, uh, Christian, can you ask Tom his thoughts on Jason Takes Manhattan? I love that one. I really appreciate it. But I want you to answer that, Tom. But if you can, what are your thoughts on, on the rest of those movies after yours? Did you did you keep up with them at the time? I, I made sure as, as – you know, lots of times I didn't because I, I started working – um, so it was very hard to, you know, go and see things, you know, in the theater. And, you know, there wasn't the days that they would show up on TV yet. Or, you know, there was, you know, uh, VHSs uh, you know, that you could catch up on, which, but I did eventually. And for me, you know, Rob Hedden is like a friend. I mean, he he was somebody that was part of the uh, the Friday series as well. And mm -hmm. one of the nicest guys. Um, I still occasionally, you know, talk with him. Um, and I mean, it, it's the same problem. All you guys know. I mean, Jason didn't take Manhattan. He took over a yacht. And Rob had these fucking amazing sequences that would have just been so incredible to see in Manhattan. But there just wasn't the budget for it. And he didn't know that when he wrote it. So he had to go in, as most people, you know, do. And it's like, yes, sir. Okay, it's going to be on the okay. And so he did the best he could. You know, with the limitations that he had, he couldn't shoot a lot in New York, you know, very small amount. And so things were up in, I, I guess it was Vancouver, you know, Vancouver. that they kind of fake for some of the streets. So it, it was like, you know, having, you know, your hands tied and go, go ahead, you know, direct the movie. So I, I you know, I kind of feel for him knowing what it should have been. But that aside, Kane is great, you know, <laughs> some great things, you know. Uh, the head knock off, you know, with the plan. I mean, there's so many, you know, wonderful things in there that I, I certainly think it has a lot of merits. Let me ask you something, Tom. Okay, you're on the you're on the inside of the business. You know how Hollywood works and things like this. Let me ask you this, Tom. My simple mind. This is what I think. Th this is the way I think this would have went down. And you tell me what you think why it didn't happen. I'm a, I'm, I'm sure you'll know. Okay. Heaton gets the approval. He gets the job. He's told the story. He said, I want to make Jason takes Manhattan. I want to make the next Jason movie out of Crystal Lake. Mancuso says, let's go to New York. So they, you know, they make that. He approves that he makes the script. I assume he finds out the budget and then they realize we can't shoot in New York. Now, Tom, let me ask you this. Why doesn't Mancuso and the team say, let's stop, let's go back to the drawing board, and let's figure something else out? Why do they go ahead with this? Is it a time thing? They got to get the movie out? I, I cannot give you the facts because I, I don't know. I mean, maybe on the, uh, you know, the definitive box set, maybe there's a discussion in there um, about – what happened, you know, or any of the interviews with Frank Mancuso or Rob Hedden about what happened. I know there's another writer on the script, so I don't know if that first writer, it was his concept, and then, you know, they gave it to Rob to, to do a, a rewrite on it, or Rob came up with it, and then this other writer came in to right. do the rewrite to make it not so much in Manhattan. I don't know the facts on that, but you know, once they really kind of, I think, looked at the fact of the costs of, you know, taking the actors and putting them up in New York and, you know, shooting basically a non-union film in the center of New York with all the, you know, unions and stuff there, I think they thought it was going to be just too dangerous and they'd get shut down. Because um, there was many shows that I've done over the years in places where the union came down from New York and said, I'm sorry, everybody in here has got to join the union. And so like the producers went crazy because the whole, the whole budget went up if they joined the union. So I, I, I'm figuring it had to have something more to do with that, not the desire not to make, you know, what Rob wanted to make at all. But that that stuff happens where suddenly you, 
you're given lemons and you somehow got to make lemonade, somehow figure it out, you know, what you right. can do with it. But the title just said so much. And unfortunately, sure. your anticipation was we're going to see, you know, Manhattan and we're going to see him in New York, you know, kicking ass like we've never seen before. So that obviously was a disappointment for people that were expecting that. Yeah. Well, let's let's give you this question, Tom. Let's give you a little break from Jason because God knows you've probably talked like a thousand miles worth of Jason in your life, probably more. He says, Tom directed The Haunting. I don't say I never get bored with it. I, That's good, cool. yeah. I love hearing people ask questions. And, and don't worry, we'll still get to, to more Jason because God knows they're pouring in. But let's give you a break for a second. Tom directed The Haunting of Helen Walker. A version of the turn of the screw. How does he feel it stands up with so many versions that's been done? Of turn of the screw? Is that what the question is? How does he feel it stands up? Oh, how he stands up. Yeah. Nobody's ever going to do it better than the innocence. The innocence, I mean, the performance, the subtlety, all of that. I mean, that was the inspiration. And then I went and read, you know, Henry James's novel, and I went, God, I would love to remake this and try to come up with some, you know, something different about it, you know, obviously make it in color, make it, you know, still do it period and things and couldn't get it made, couldn't get it made, couldn't get it made. Finally, there was a, a, a producer that made a lot of these very early TV movies in England and he had a deal with the companies over there and he said, yeah, you know, we'll do it. We'll get like a great British cast and all that. And it's CBS but said, okay, but you got to put Valerie Bertinelli in there because Valerie and Tom have this great working relationship and, you know, it, we've got to have her in there. And of course I'm going, God, I love Valerie. You know, at this point I'm close with her. I'm close with Eddie Van Halen. You know, we've spent Christmases together. They go trick or treating wow. in my neighborhood on Halloween, you know, and I'm going, how could this, wait a minute. What if she's an American? who marries an Englishman who dies and she needs work. So she's really a fish out of water and gets this job and has to take care of these, these children. And the fact that, you know, I made the children, you know, as young as I could make them and had sort of this weird sexuality going on between them because of the ghosts, you know, uh, of the, the previous Danny and uh, um, what's his name, Clint? No, uh, I forgot the character's name too. Uh, all right. Anyway, the, 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 you know, the villain of the piece. So these kids were, you know, in basically had their, their, these people's souls in them. So it seemed like where the little boy's looking at her with his hands behind his head. And after just, you know, French kissing her, which by Valerie's reaction, you've got that sense to me that that was sort of the horrific, Oh my God, you know, how scary is this? But I was, you know, it was a TV movie. We were strapped with kind of, you know, that TV movie look. So there's a lot of things that I wished I could have, you know, done as a, more of a feature. But, you know, Valerie was always, you know, wonderful to work with. Having Diana Rigg, you know, all these great, you know, Michael Goff, all these great Hammer horror film alumni, mm. you know, there. And just making something in England at this, you know, huge manor house was incredible. And, you know, quick side story. One night, this place was supposed to be haunted. So one night we talked to the, the, the man, the night manager. So Eddie Van Halen, me, Valerie, and my ex-wife went with a flashlight up through the rooms, you know, and this guy was showing us where all the haunted rooms were and stuff. And just to see like, you know, or feel like Eddie holding on my arm as we're going. <laughs> and, you know, and I, I just thought, this is just like, Who's going to believe this? You know, <laughs> oh going, my God. I mean, with Eddie Van Halen, I mean, and his death, I got it, it was devastating to me. Devastating. Two weeks of just fucked up beyond belief. But anyway, um, but I mean, that, so the movie had all these other wonderful perks, you know, about doing it. So it was a lot of fun, even though it wasn't quite, you know, the vision that I, I was hoping for. Excellent. Well, you got a lot of fans for it here. I can tell you that. Um, Volley Jack, uh, he's asked this question a couple of times. I don't want to skip him. Uh, how much footage was shot with Dan Bradley as Jason before being replaced? Well, we started the movie with Dan Bradley. He was hired because he was a stunt coordinator who also was large enough to do Jason, you know, size wise. So, you know, we prepped everything with him. 
And the way we shot is, you know, you, you know, we shot the daytime stuff first, you know, got that out of the way, and then we went into nights. So it was, you know, six day weeks. So you had one one day off, you know, Sunday, and then your sleep Monday day, and get up, you know, Monday afternoon, and go shooting, uh, you know, Monday night. So those first couple days were all the paintball stuff. So basically, most of those shots you were there, you know, you see other than the arm being pulled up after he's ripped it off of the, you know, the asshole paintball baller, that was yeah. CJ. But all the rest of the stuff in there, like when he's hit with the, you know, the pellet the, and with the red paint and stuff, that's all, you know, Dan Bradley. Um, but basically what happened, unfortunately, is, you know, the dailies went to New York, went to Los Angeles. We were shooting in Georgia. So they saw it at Paramount before I even saw it. And I get this phone call going, we don't like the way Dan looks. We don't like the way he walks. We don't like his size, you know. So we're replacing him with your second choice, you know, CJ Graham. And I was like, what? Wait a minute. You know, you, you can't do that. You can't just take take the man out. I've been working with him and stuff. No, it's over. It's gone. He's already on the plane. And it's like, so to this day, I still have not had that. I am so sorry this happened with Dan Bradley. But that aside, Dan Bradley... <laughs> went on to be the biggest second unit director probably of all time. He does the James Bond movies. He does the Born Identity movies. All those crazy stunts that you see, that's all Jan Dan Bradley's creation. He figures out how to do those things. The car spinning eight times in the air before it crashes. In the I mean, all of that is Dan. So, you know, he's been enormously successful. So I don't, I don't particularly worry too much about, you know, him lamenting he didn't do Jason. Now, now let me ask you this, Tom, because again, I'm an inquisitive guy, mm -hmm. not taking anything away from CJ Graham. The fans love him. He's awesome. There's no denying that. Take me back to you get this call and you have to make these changes. Mm -hmm. I want the real guttural truth. Are you thinking to yourself, man, this is ridiculous. There ain't nothing. Did you guys see Jason in part four? He wasn't exactly skinny there either. He was a big monster. I mean, you got to be upset at the time, right? Yeah, I was. I was because, you know, I remember CJ was good and I go, you know, what else did he did? Did he do? Well, he's been this bouncer at this club and, uh, you know, one night, I guess it was Halloween or something, he came out as Jason and it just, it really worked, you know. Um, and, you know, and he's, you know, out of the army or uh, Marines. And uh, so, you know, he, he, you know, he'll, he'll be good. He'll, he'll follow, you know, your directions because, you know, it'll be like orders. And I was going, you know, he's not even a movie person. And, you know, Dan was going to do his own stunts and everything because he was a stunt man. And they hired, they had to hire. A, st a stunt coordinator now, so they couldn't get the two-in-one package that they had. But the first day on the set, meeting CJ and picking up this vibe of, you know, yes, sir, I can do that. I did, and he did everything like a soldier. And I started looking at him, going, you know what? This is much better. If you're going to electrify somebody and bring them back, they got to have some of that Terminator, you know moves and all that shit. So I kind of just shifted gears and kind of went that direction with the way, you know, he did things and stuff. And in the long run, to me, that really worked for that movie. Sure. Um, I thought Kane Hodder did an incredible job. I loved he added the breathing before he does things, you know, that was kind of his touch. And, you know, all the guys, you know, previous all had different aspects and stuff. But having worked with CJ and having been friends now with him for 35 years and, you know, he's the nicest guy in the world. And, and when I was writing Jason Never Dies, I'm only thinking of CJ playing the part because to me, again, that's that, that's that kind of continuation from Jason Lives into this uh, next story, which actually happens in 1999, 13 years after he'd been put down in the lake. So when he comes up, somebody in a lake for 13 years, there's going to be some, in some interesting things about the oh, way man. you look. So, Don't mess with me, Tom. Don't mess yeah, with me. I, you know, I've already had somebody who got the, the mask designed. There's going to be touches that, you know, if you if you got the mask, 
if I can get this made, you're gonna have to now buy a fucking another mask because you're gonna love th what this one is gonna look like. That's fine. You know how many of these suckers I got in this house? That's fine. I'll get. I'll take more <laughs> of them. Uh, well, Tom, here we got this. Are you fine with a few more? I don't want to keep you too sure. long. Yeah, I'm. I'm good. Okay, thank you guys. Tom, we got a question from Jess Graham. He wants to know uh, just some experiences on Sometimes They Come Back, of a film that's had a lot of comments. I'm a big fan of Sometimes They Come Back as well. Uh, Sometimes They Come Back was un... What can I say? I never thought that it was going to become sort of one of my favorite, like, family, warm connect to on a whole different level than I ever thought. I mean, I went in going, all right, I'm doing the Stephen King movie. Um, the script wasn't really great. It didn't feel really like a, you know, a Stephen King movie the way I looked at it. And Dino De Laurentiis agreed. So, you know, we had a we had it rewritten. And when we when by the time the movie got greenlit, my father was dying. And he literally passed away a week before we left. Mm. My daughter was born. So suddenly I had, you know, a new child. I had Vic Garris and I had two TV series for Universal, you know, She-Wolf of London. And they came from outer space that we were trying to get writers and directors, you know, to do those episodes. And my best friend, Stephen Banks, had this show that I had directed in San Francisco that was now a Disney Showtime a uh, piece called the Home Entertainment Center. All of that was going on simultaneously, you know, as as I went into the pre-production of this movie. So when we got to Kansas, you know, I had not mourned for the loss of my father. I had my daughter, which I obviously put a, as much love, you know, as I could and direct a movie at the same time, you know. Ooh, her. Wow. And, you know, it was crazy. And the movie was cursed. There was no two ways about it. Every day, something went wrong. And the schedule that we had went over like a week, which you cannot do in any movie, doesn't matter. And basically for a movie that was gonna be released in Europe as a low budget widescreen you know, movie, and then a TV movie for CBS, it had to be you know, framed this way. All these different components, everything went wrong. You know, Film was not processed correctly. Brooke Adams fell and twisted her ankle. She couldn't shoot. First day of shooting, we had two feet of snow. Nobody expected. We only had exteriors. So we were behind day one, you know, one day already. So, you know, it had all these problems. But when it all came together and Terry Plumeri put this score to it, it just had this thing about it for me that was like, yeah, that kind of had all those humanity aspects that were going on in my life all sort of filtered into it. So I, I really have a very, you know, strong fondness, you know, for the movie. And for a lot of people, it, you know, it really rang true, which, you know, I didn't expect at the time. It just felt like this was really, you know, some movies you make and some movies you survive. And this was a survival movie, you know, that yeah. the fact I got through it was amazing. And the fact that it actually worked was, you know, just a shock. It was, you know, a wonderful shock. That's, you know, we, we, us fans, you know, we watch these movies and, you know, it just seems like, oh, they probably just spent, you know, a month filming it and here it is. Like, we don't understand the, the, the hell that filmmakers go through and, you know, these tales of what you got to deal with. You know, we, we're so ignorant to that. You know, it just, it always blows my mind when I hear this kind of stuff, all the problems and, probably a lot of hurry up and wait, all that stuff with filmmaking. I mean, it's it, it can't be as glamorous as it seems to be, right, from the outside looking in? Well, it, it's, you know, it used to be glamorous in that you would have like a screening and everybody would come and you could sit there, you know, you know, in, in your nice clothes and as opposed to the funky clothes you've been in, you know, directing and editing and all that stuff. So there was a glamour in that or that, you know, when things would come out initially on VHS or whatever, and everybody would gather together and you'd have a screening at your house and, every, you know, there was, you know, a real joy in that. Now everything's so accessible, it, you know, hardly ever do you have these, you know, these big premieres and certainly over the last year, we haven't had anything. So, you know, you kind of look back fondly on, on that, but right. the, the difficulties of making a movie for all the people that want to direct, 
you have no idea until you get in there and have 80 people asking you questions that you better fucking have an answer because Ooh. if they see, you know, you, uh, I don't, uh, you cannot do that. You have to done your homework and have answers. And then the Scorsese I learned once said, sometimes the answer is, I don't know, but I'm going to find out for you. Hold on. I'm going to talk to the, you know, the DP, if it's a camera thing or a producer, whatever, get them an answer, you know, show that you're in charge. <laughs> but, you know, most of the time you really just have, it's, it's like an endurance thing. As soon as you go to bed, all you're thinking about is everything you didn't get. You know, you got to wake up the next morning, forget all that start again and hope to God something doesn't go wrong. And right. you know, there was, there's movies where like sometimes where everything seemed to go wrong day after day after day. And then others, you just like, God, we're done. Oh my God. You know, everybody loved each other. I did this crazy little movie called uh, the fab five, the Texas cheerleader scandal. And I was surrounded by cheerleaders. I cast some of the most gorgeous girls I've ever seen, you know, Dog. and it was just yeah. like, you know, these kind of badass girls based on a true story. And we shot in New Orleans. We had so much fun on that movie. There was such a great vibe, you know, grips were hugging grips and, you know, <laughs> just had fun. And it was, you know, we never, nobody took it seriously. We just really kind of enjoyed the whole experience. And, you know, those are the ones you go, yeah, God, that just, you know, was a blast. But in terms of movies, Friday the 13th was right up there with everybody loved each other, got along. It was typical because it was all nights and, you know, you had to sleep all day. And God forbid, if you had some life that you had to have during the day, you had to go to work with no sleep. So, oh boy. you know, outside of that, it was, you know, a lot of fun. Yeah. Right here, Tom, this is actually a really cool question, you know, precursor. Uh, I, my favorite musician on the planet, the best rock show I've ever seen was Alice Cooper. Dude, still killing it. My favorite. I love everything from the blackout stuff to the 80s stuff, to, you name it. So, yeah. you know, you having t Alice in this movie is amazing. You know, how did that, can you tell, how involved were you with that? How did that come to play? Because I always wondered, Tom, is it is it record labels that make deals with Paramount to get songs and movies? How does that all work? And how did that come to fruition with Alice? Well, this was kind of an interesting situation because me being a former rocker, you know, rock music and particularly, you know, the cool stuff and some of them, you know, more heavy metal-ish stuff that I was loving, you know, I wanted as a lot of people call it, it's the rock and roll Jason movie, you know, because, you know, the songs, the felony that you had somebody cover that was, I heard earlier. I me. never heard that before. Yeah. That was great, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that the music was really cool. And I happened to put in, you know, an Alice song in there. And when Frank heard it, he goes, would you like Alice to actually do some music? I mean, like write a song? I said, you fucking kidding? I knew him when he was Vincent and he had a group called the Naz and we actually played on the same bills in the sixties and we would hang out together at Frank Zappa's house in Laurel Canyon. As I Frank Zappa. Oh, God. And that was it. I have not seen Alice since I was on that couch with him in 66, 67 or whatever. This whole deal kind of happened with me saying, yes, that would be great. Alice writing, you know, the man behind the mask. Then I said, is there any chance he could give us, you know, a couple other songs? Yeah. Which ones do you like? Hard Rock Summer and, and the Teenage Frankenstein. Yeah, you can have those too. Great. You know, so all these years now, 35 years, every time there's a convention, somehow we don't hook up. Then there was this one night change. that he was, you know, he was going to come and we had a screening of the movie and he was going to actually come and surprise everybody. And his road manager called and goes, we got all messed up. The, the tour thing got messed up. He's not actually coming into town. So it was like, ah, shit, you know. So to this day, you know, I'm still waiting for that fucking photo op, you know, with my arm around Alice Cooper. Oh, my God. And I had not, you know, back in the day, back in the 60s, I was doing, I was blowing things up on stage. I was, you know, jumping into the audience. I did all this crazy stuff that was sort of a precursor to what I ended up doing later. But then when I saw Alice, I went, holy shit, he's putting on, 
you know, this incredible, you know, hangings and, you know, obviously Jason coming out there and all the amazing, cool stuff. And I went, if I had stayed, you know, in rock and roll, that's what I would have done exactly, you know, what he, what he's doing. Um, so it was like, you know, obviously great to see how much success and the longevity that he's still doing it. He's still so fucking cool. I mean, yeah. I, a huge, huge Alice fan. Me too, man. I tell you, Tom, he's my hero. Musically, he's my hero. But I love that song, Felony. Like, I, I, I'm i a yeah. musician too. And I mean, I don't know if the intro was playing well, but I covered Man Behind the Mask in the, in the previous one and a, a felony song. I always wanted to make that a rock song, so I covered that. I love that oh, song. Um, you great. know, let me ask you this, Tom. Nerdy question. Mm -hmm. Bear with me. Did When you when – you, there were the, I on the box set, The Life and Times of Alice Cooper. There is a demo version of Man Behind the Mask, which yeah. is literally trick bag with Man Behind the Mask lyrics from the Constrictor album. Did that version ever get to you back in the yes. day? What yes. you, okay, and can you tell me what you thought? Were you the one that were like, "Can we try something else? I'm not digging this," or were you like, "This is great. Let's use it." You didn't like no. it. Here's the here, no. Here's the irony. No. That version was the first version I heard, and I went. That's it. That's fucking great. I love that. You know, and then suddenly I get a phone call. Nah, they they want to put synth in it. They want to have a little more 80s vibe. And I went, this is Alice Cooper. This is hard rock. Are you kidding me? Can I talk to him? Nope, nope. This has already been figured out. Wow. So I still have, you know, a, a cassette of that version, you know, that lots of times I'll play for people. Do you want to hear how it was originally? Because I, I loved what that was. Now, wow. as the years have gone on, now as I get on stage with my own band and sing man behind the mask, you know, I've come to appreciate it. And of course we're all very hard rock and we don't have a synth or anything up there. So we're, we're doing it in that flavor of the first one, but you know, different cause that had some different lyrics and things in it. Uh, right. The first version. Uh, but no, I, I was the exact opposite. I, I, I wanted that, you know, that first wow. one and, um, you know, it, it's like they they needed to make Alice a hit again. You know, I think record sales and things were were slipping at that time. So it was like kind of a important thing that that next album really take off. And I wanted to do the music video. You know, I mean, that to me was a natural rock and roll guy doing the thing. You know, the director did. Nope, no, we have a guy. You know, that we always use. So. You know, I was frustrated at that because I really wanted to, you know, do something. I would have done something very different than what the video is. Um, but, you know, say la vie, you know, that just things, that things don't always work out. See, see Tom, this is awesome. I, I may be the only per. I don't know if anybody's ever asked you that before. I, I feel like I'm probably the only weirdo that wanted to know that because I'm such a big fan of Alice and all that. But so if you were in charge, would we be hearing that trick bag version on the movie till this day? Then we'd be hearing the original Man Behind yeah. the Mask. Yeah. See, that makes me like you even more. <laughs> <laughs> That's I mean, awesome. Yeah. I mean, you know, that was one of those things where basically um, I, I was outvoted by the powers, you know, that were above me, which is a record label and Paramount. And, you know, Alice was giving us an incredible – his, you know, manager and everybody, incredible break on, you know, what the, the song, cost of the songs were. So, you know, when they decided that they wanted to do something different, you know, the director's preference, you know, was not up there. You know, obviously it was, I was Michael Bay or somebody that would go ballistic, you know, and fucking take my name off the picture. That'd be different, but no, oh, wow. I was not my, this is my second movie. They were really nice to me to let me make the movie I wanted to make. And it wasn't like the other song version sucked. It was just, you know, different. And it wasn't, it didn't have the same vibe that I thought, you know, the original had, but as I uh, said, yeah. you know, I, I've come to, you know, love both of them for sure. Me too. Yeah. All right. Well, Tom, all right, Tom I'll, take, I'll take a few more. I, I appreciate all the time you've given me. Blood sure. Red Skies, what is the longest you went without sleep while working on a film? <laughs> wow. Um, you know, I think the, the, the times without sleep really were more the writing process uh, on, on film where it's just like, I, I've got to get through the script, you know, and like keep drinking the, you know, we didn't have star, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Red Bull in those days, Red Bull and all. you know, coffee and coffee, coffee, you know, to try to keep going. So I, I know there was 
uh, at least a three day thing, both in editing where we had to finish a cut and we just, you know, we're just like bent over. Okay. Uh, you know, and you know, you get through it. Um, when I did the Freddy's nightmare, thing, that was one of those marathon. I think we had three days of editing on that. And the editor was Jeez. just so angry at me because, you know, it's like, we're going to get this thing. We're getting through this thing. So there's been a number of times like that, but usually with the movies, I managed to get at least a couple of hours in, you know, somehow knock myself out, somehow go into some meditative state, you know, which, which you know, uh, uh, a number of directors kind of have learned to do. And I've worked with some Asian camera people and stuff during lunch, you know, they just meditate, you know, so that they're they're good for as many hours wow. as, as those long shoots can be. And, Korean films and, you know, Japanese and, and Chinese films, you know, the, the clock does not exist. They just keep going, they'll sleep on the set and then keep going. And the student films too, you know, wow. it just, you know, their work ethic is incredible. Jesus. But, yeah. Wow. All right, Tom, right here, we got Matthew Urban, $3 Super Chat. Thank you, Matthew. He says, would Tom consider crowdfunding Jason Never Dies? I, I would love to be <laughs> able to do that. Um, but the idiot that I am, I made this a bit too expensive to to actually, you know, be able to do a crowdfunding because normally you get, I don't know, fifty to a hundred thousand dollars, you know, with those. Some of the bigger ones, you know, get more. I think, you know, I know Penn Gillette and he did this uh this low budget movie, and I think they raised, you know, like a million, you know, which was incredible but pen i mean the, the the perks were like come up you know to las vegas see pen and teller stay at my house you know <laughs> you know you get a free hotel room you know you get the, i mean the perks were so incredible if you were a pen and teller fan you were pumping in the money but us friday fans we ain't got that kind of money you know to right. keep doing it so like vengeance did a cool thing you know if you you put in i don't know what it was a thousand dollars or five hundred you can be killed by Jason in the movie. So there was a number of people never acted before. They actually did a you know really good job, and you know they got to be in a Jason movie and get killed by Jason, you know, for their money. Um, so I mean, those are you know great great perks. But as far as mine goes, you know, it's shooting in snow. Um, I know, and, and and this is like the weird thing. Uh, Vincent Desante and I were both writing Jason in the snow pieces at the same time having no idea we were both doing it. I announced, you know, my thing. He calls me up, he goes, holy shit, you're doing, I'm doing one of those too, you know, but it's just a short. And, you know, and I said, I'm sure it's a hundred percent different, you know, than what I'm doing. And it was, um, but, you know, because he was doing a crowdfunded one, he was able to get it done and out. I'm still sitting there waiting for these guys to, you know, finish this lawsuit to see if I even got a, you know, a shot at the plate. Uh, but the, the combination of shooting nights in the snow is miserable. The, 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 the fact that you're going to have to make snow because, you know, it goes away. You know, sun comes out the right. next morning. You cannot match shit. Also, we've got people in cabins and stuff, which means if we shot like in a real location, as you probably would on a fun in a fan funded thing, that means the whole crew has to stay out in the freezing cold all night while we're in a nice cozy cabin shooting close-ups of actors, actresses. And, you know, I thought, you know, we have to build the cabins and that's a cost. And when we would fake the outside for those sequences that place inside. So all these things start, you know, upping the budget. So it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to try to do it as a fan funded thing. It's just, it just becomes, you know, very, very costly. So, and you know, yeah, oh, go ahead, Tom. I'm sorry. Finish. And, you, and finish. you know, the opening sequence, as I said, you know, there's, there's so many effects and things that are going on in there. Some of the kills obviously are, well, you know, they're doing some great shit in the low budget fan film things. I mean, they're doing stuff. I'm going, you'd never get past the MPAA with that stuff. You know, the, the oh, yeah. cords coming up with the head, you know, all this incredible stuff. But I have some stuff that, you know, is pretty intense and, you know, needs to be done really well for it to be believable. But as I said, all these factors kind of make it more of a, like a studio or an independent film. And, you know, I was hoping that Jason Blum, the Blumhouse 
would somehow get the rights and maybe, you know, they would make one that would have all these, you know, these elements to it. Um, but the truth is Warner's and uh, New Line own, you know, the distribution because Paramount gave it up. And whoever ends up doing it, Victor, who won the case, but he's only got Friday the 13th and he can remake the first one, but he doesn't have Jason. He doesn't have the hockey mask Jason. John's got the hockey mask Jason, but he can't call it Friday the 13th. Tom, you know? I'm so confused. This this is what's so, you know what I'm saying? There's so many moving pieces with this. It's yeah. like, I can't even, you know, it's it's insane. But it's, you know, not I was gonna... about, it's not about the money. I mean, many of the fans think, oh, how much money do they need? Not about the money. This right. is a whole other level of a fight. So, so it's like we got a we've got a pie here, the Friday the thirteenth pie. Warner uh, Warner Brothers has a piece. Now Victor's got a little piece, but you know, new line distribution here, foreign this. So it's like there's so many hands in this, and yeah. it's just a mess, right? Yeah. And I was gonna say, Tom, you know, in, in terms of crowdfunding, I don't know what Warner and all those companies think about this. Obviously, they're not stopping the Vincent DeSantis and stuff like that, which is great. But like Tom McLaughlin doing a fan film, that would probably get way too much notice. And I could imagine you'd be getting some phone calls, wouldn't you think? Yeah. I, I mean, it, it it does scare me, that idea, even, you know, appearing in some of these things and have, you know, people go, well, why are you doing this, you know, for free? And, you know, and I go, because they got... They, whatever money they get, they use that money to make the film. We don't get paid, and the rest of the money goes to charity. And it's like, you know, this, these are passion projects. And I feel this, you know, young filmmaker in my mind, it's like, yeah, let's do this, man. Let's get up there. Yeah, just give me a plane ticket to Portland. I'll be there. You know, get me a room, get me a cot. I don't, you know, I, I love all that, you know, gorilla, you know, just do it. But once all this stuff, you know, finally somebody says, you know, no, I own the rights now, you know, they're going to stop all this thing. You know, they stopped the game, you know, and because it started to get really, you know, made some serious money. Because in the beginning, when I, you know, did my little contribution with the Pamela Voorhees tapes for the game, I kept going, how the hell are you guys getting away with this? And it's like, yeah, they seem to be fine. We weren't even going to do it as a Friday the 13th. And then we asked Paramount and they said, yeah, so, you know, we're doing it. And I think these Paramount and these people didn't realize how big this thing was going to get, how much the fans were going to love it, how they were going to, you know, these guys are going to bring in Tom Matthews and, you know, make this thing ultra cool. And mm -hmm. somewhere along that line, at, the, at that point, it was like, nope, no more. You know, the brakes went on the game. Um, now, none of us can really make money off of a Friday the 13th thing, but certainly people do merchandising, certainly, you know, all the characters, so much stuff, you know, I go, shit, you know, I, I see that that model of, of uh, Tom Matthews holding on to Jason and he's got the chain and the rock. And he's floating there and I, you know, you, you think to yourself, I thought that up, but I don't get a penny for any of that. But there's the other side of it going, if I was a kid and I saw that, I'd go, that is so fucking cool. I love that. I got to buy that. And it's like, fuck me. I don't make any money on it. But, you know, I, I know I came up with the idea, you know, but everybody else is really about how much can we make off of these ideas. So I can't. You're telling me that NECA is not sending you toys of the movie you made? NECA, this is ridiculous. Ridiculous. Well, you know, well, when I did the movie, too, I wasn't in the Director's Guild. So. I, I get no residuals from any of the Friday the 13th at all, other than as a writer, because I was in the Writers Guild at that time. Yeah. I got none of the profit participation I was supposed to get because for years they said, we're not making any money here. And then by the time, you know, I said, well, wait a minute, there's no way this thing is not made three times, it's five times, 10 times, you know. It's like, nope, we don't know anything about that. So, man, you know, it's like if you guys are doing it for the money, it's going to be a, a short road. Uh, the only thing to me that you've got to hold on to is, is your passion for what it is you love to do. And, and that it's like the money people, there's, there's so many other ways people can make money, you know, <laughs> in the stock market, do whatever. But if you're going to be an artist, if you're going to be a filmmaker, you want to please people. You've got to do stuff that, you know, you say, do you like that? Did that work? What if I did it this way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. I mean, that's to me, that's the hit. That's why, 
we do what we do is so that we all share in some you know idea. And I love when somebody from the crew goes, what, what would you think about this? And I go, hey, stop, stop work. He has just come up with the best fucking idea. Of this movie. <laughs> We're doing it. And if anybody else got a great idea, tell me. I can't promise you I'm going to do them, but please tell it. Because I love that whole communal making a film. You know, it's not the director's movie. It's everybody's movie. Their name's on it. They got to care. And I think if you can contribute to something, obviously, as the fan-funded ones do, you want that thing to come out well. Mm -hmm. Your name's on yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Tom, I'm not going to keep you too much longer. Just thank you so much for giving me this time. It's truly the greatest day of my YouTube journey having you on <laughs> with me. This is a cool question, okay? Because as I've gotten older, Tom, you'll be happy to know that I've gotten into the more classic movies, especially the Universal era. So go. Nico, a good friend of mine, he wants to know what is your favorite classic Universal horror film or franchise? I guess, oh man, that's hard. It, it it really is kind of neck and neck with the original Dracula with Bela Lugosi and the original Frankenstein and the Bride of Frankenstein. I There's so much stuff I love about the Bride of Frankenstein. Um, and I mean, there's even something I borrowed if you guys are fans of Bride of Frankenstein in the beginning when there's the, the, the parents of the little girl who was killed in the first one. You know, the father, you know, wants to go down into the water and I just like, I want to see his blackened bones so I can sleep at night. That idea is what I gave to, you know, Tommy Jarvis. Yeah. It's like, why do you got to dig him up? I just got to see him and I'm going to, you know, burn his fucking body. You know, he brought the can of gasoline. And again, that was, you know, a direct inspiration from that. Um, wow! So man. That, that movie and all the the humor that was in Bride of Frankenstein, all that that James Whale put in, it was just to me so much fun, so great. And then the original, just you know, there's something about that and Dracula and the old soundtrack, you know, just the the hiss of the of the record that things were recorded on, and that there was so little music in the original Dracula. It just was so creepy and wonderful. So both of those you know, pretty neck and neck for me. And I really identified, uh, you know, very much with Frankenstein and, you know, Dracula. I just love that, you know, <laughs> what he was able to do. And both creatures, if you remember, lamented over the fact that they didn't stay dead. You know, Dracula says, you know, to be dead, really dead must be glorious. And Frankenstein says, you know, love dead, hate living, you know, and, to me, that's sort of where the heartbreak about being a monster is. It's not that they want to go out and do this. It's like, this is their fate. And they, you know, they end up doing it. And Tommy Jarvis brought him back to life. Not anything that he was choosing, you know, somebody else caused it. So as far as I was concerned, you know, he, he was going to get that boy's ass one way or the other. Wow, This is great stuff, man. It's great hearing you talk about this. This is so cool. You know, Tom, we're going to start wrapping things up. We've almost gone two hours. Again, this has been amazing. How about this? And I know you kind of talked about what you've got going on in the near future. You're, you're heading out to, to Florida. But uh, baby Herman asks, will Tom be appearing at any conventions in the future? Love your work. Thank you. Well, I was just out at Days of the Dead in Atlanta about a month ago. Uh, we went down there and did the masks, you know, did the, the distancing and all that. Um, it bugged me. So basically I had the fans, you know, if they do selfies, you know, I said, you know, you stand in front of the table, you take off your mask. I'm going to take off all my mask and I'm going to lean in. So at least we'll get our faces, you know, because this thing with the mask just bothered the crap out of me. Um, yep. So, you know, it, it was a way of sort of bending the rules and, you know, you know, giving a fan at least their face and my face in the same picture. So there, I, I wanted to do the one that's coming up the days of the dead in uh, Las Vegas. Um, cause they got CJ, they got Tom Matthews and they got fucking Alice Cooper. And I couldn't get on that. You know, they had already booked it and stuff. Um, what? Yeah. It was like, you know, sorry. It's just like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get you for the Chicago one or something. And I'm doing chiller, uh, which is coming up and that's in New Jersey, I think New York and New Jersey. I think it's New Jersey. The chiller, you know, conventions been going on for years. Um, and we're supposed to go to Manchester, England um, for, I think it's called the horror of it all. Um, that's in, I think, October. And then I'm going back to the camp where we shot it 
you know, in, in Covington, Georgia, spending the night with the fans. We're going to show the movie, you know, at the oh, actual man. camp. I will take you to the locations of where we shot stuff. And I'm there to, you know, hang out, party, <laughs> do whatever. And for me, it's a great, you know, hit to be able to spend that much time with people who love the movie and get to go back to the location, which I haven't seen since I shot there. So, you know, that's wow. coming up too. So, I'm, you know, I'm really big on getting to as many conventions as I can. Not that it's like this, you know, huge money making thing, but it's just a chance to really, you know, connect with people and hopefully, you know, give them, you know, a smile, something that, you know, that's like, I, I so appreciate seeing you and, and, you know, having pictures are like, now I'm, I'm selling the original script that, that I just found like two months ago, the, the original draft that I turned in, that has the naked girl in it, that has Jason's father in it, that has you know, a lot of little things that ended up getting changed, you know, as we were getting into the actual shooting. So it's, it's you know, I, I autographed that, you know, you know, to whoever, you know, would like to have it. So, you know, there's, the, there's that kind of thing too that I love about it saying, here's something nobody else has, if you guys would like it. Yeah. Well, well, Tom, as we wind down, I want to ask you this last question, and I, I, I genuinely mean this. You know, as as the chats progressed all night, we've had a very lively chat, 80 people basically this whole time just chomping at the bit to ask questions. I couldn't ask every question. You know, through there's been a constant thread throughout this comment section. Friday six is my favorite one. Friday six is my second favorite one. Or, you know, it, and I'm seeing this so often. And it's my it's my favorite as well. How how does it feel? Like I really want to know what it, how does it feel to have these so many millions of people around the world tell you this in this massive franchise? You have millions of fans around the world, and not only to have an entry in one of the, and probably would you call it the biggest horror franchise ever made? Friday Absolutely. the Thirteenth. Yeah, no, I, it is. I mean, there's nobody can really deny that at this point. You know. What does it feel like to genuinely have a the, the, the one of the fan the top two to three fan favorite entries ever? Like, do you wake up and like stop sometimes and say, "Jesus Christ, what 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 what, what did I do? Like, this is insane." Is I mean, it, has yeah. it really dawned on you? I mean, every day because you meet fans all the time and they keep coming. Mm. The more people have babies, the more Friday the Thirteenth fans there are. Like, what does that feel like? You know, it, the, the, the things that I really, really love are like three months ago, we went to get dog food at, at Pets, the Pets R Us or one of those kind of places. I had the mask on and I had my girlfriend with me, you know, we're looking for pet food and couple comes over and goes, are you Tom McLaughlin? And I went, yeah, how did you know that? He goes, oh, I, you know, I've seen your picture on the internet. And he just, you know, I sat there and talked to the guy for like 20 minutes in a, in a you know, dog's food place. And I just thought, how did he, you know, even recognize me? Things like that are just absolutely amazing to me. And I don't look at like I did anything other than I tried to make a really good movie. I and I didn't set out to go, I don't know, I'm gonna make the definitive Friday the 13th. I didn't know. I went in saying I'm gonna put humor, I'm gonna put everything I know as a filmmaker into it. And and hope you know it works for as a movie. And never thought it would have. None of us did. You know, have how long the series has gone on, and how it's just become such a you know iconic thing to people. So every day, every time somebody says, "I loved your movie," you know, it's my favorite. I'm st I still have that. Thank you. I I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. And I do. It's it's not like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's like, it's a blessing. You know, the fact that it happened, the fact that I said yes, the fact that somehow it worked, you know, is incredible kismet that that all just occurred. And, you know, as I look out my window here in the backyard, I've got Jason's tombstone, you know, the actual tombstone that sits out there. And down in my basement, I have his coffin. So- What? <laughs> When people go down the stairs, there's his coffin sitting there. You know, what's that? I go, Jason's coffin. Bullshit. That's Jason's coffin. That's his tombstone. Is that styrofoam? No, that's a real tombstone. That is, 
you know, because we couldn't afford a styrofoam one. We had to have somebody in Georgia make a real concrete tombstone. I mean, it takes three guys to lift that damn thing. But, you know, there it sits. So, you know, when people wow. come out, it's like, you know, do you want to see Jason's tombstone? You know, I just bought, <laughs> my girlfriend wants to kill me. I don't want to tell you guys how much I spent. It, it was so, I bought like a nine foot King Kong and I'm creating this, you know, putting him up on like an altar. So he's just really huge. He looks incredible. Somebody made him in the Philippines. And it's like, I, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get him over because he's like 300 pounds of soft in. But again, it's like, I want to have King Kong in my backyard. I want people to come over and I go, you want, you want to meet Kong? You want to take your picture with Kong? So, I mean, I'm still fucking crazy, you know, that way. And the guy who bought it from me, he goes, I just want to see another crazy person like me, you know, <laughs> why the hell you'd want it. And I go, I don't know why I just do, you know, there's just need, something. Yeah. and it's not about me having it. It's, I want to share it. I want people to come over and go, yeah, that's great. You know, I got, I got to take a picture with Kong or Jason's tombstone or his coffin or, you know, whatever. So it's just, do me, do me, do me a favor, Tom. Mm -hmm. I don't, you don't have a YouTube channel, do you? I did. They took it down. I don't know what I did to offend them. They won't tell me, but I had something on there that they took it down. But if you go on YouTube and you put my name in, there is some kind of a channel that's left over uh, of some sort. So yeah, that it's on if, there. Well, if you haven't, because I've I've never tried to search your name for a YouTube channel. If you haven't, you need to put this stuff online for the fans to see, like this <laughs> Jason's tombstone and stuff. We got to see this. Yeah. So I'm begging you at, at your <laughs> earliest convenience, take your cell phone, whatever, film it, just show it and put it online. We have got to see this stuff and the King Kong. I love King Kong. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. let's say somebody recently have, there's like a, a small <laughs> fan <laughs> thing in uh, Spain and they call it, you know, called me and said, can you be part of this? And like, we ask everybody to do a little short introduction, you know, hi, I'm Tom McLaughlin. I'm here to, <laughs> tell you, you got to watch this thing or whatever. And I thought, you know, this would be a great place, you know, to introduce the coffin downstairs. So yeah, the, the, uh, you know, I had my girlfriend take the cell camera, go towards the coffin, you know, I open up the thing and it's like, wait a minute, it's not night. What the hell are you waking me up for? Oh, hi guys. You know, and just kind of use it as an intro thing. But you know, it's like, I, I want to try to find different things like that. So it's like, again, kind of a fun way to use it rather than just be, you know, well, here it is. You know, it, it's like you got to do something entertaining. With yeah, it. that's that is amazing, man. That is so cool. So, Tom, you know, the the one thing I wanted to say at the end of this was obviously you're going to live forever. I mean, b from the work you've done. But some pe some people were talking about this in the comment section. You have a do you have a designated resting place? Yes. I don't make this short because I'm sure people are bored to death of hearing me going on and on. No way. <laughs> From a former mime who never spoke for most of his early career. Um, but yes, when I turned 60, my family had a birthday party for me at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, which is where I wrote Friday the 13th and where I shot part of One Dark Night. And when I was there, I went back the next day to thank them for allowing this, you know, incredible party. It was sort of like the end of my career, you know, it felt like, cause you know, there's like a hundred and something people that from all different parts of my life. And if you, if you get the book, uh, Strange Life, a, a Strange Idea of Entertainment, you'll see like that photo in there. It's like in the beginning of all those people that came. But I said to the people, you know, that ran the place, you know, it, it was always been a dream ever since I made One Dark Night to actually be in that mausoleum. But I know it's been taken up for the years. You know, it, it started with Rudolph Valentino back in 1928 and has all these, you know, people in there. And he goes, you know what? We found a couple things that actually weren't owned. You want to see them? I went, are you kidding? He's like, yeah, come on. They put me in a golf cart, take me over to the thing. And they go, well, there's one crypt way up there and there's one crypt way over there, and there's one right here. And I go, I have to have it. Now, buying that thing had a little bit to do with my divorce, not all, but the fact that I did it and made payments for like two years, you know, to have this thing, because suddenly it all kind of hit me at the same time. I went, I don't want this to be the third act of my life. 
you know, the wrap up. I want to still stay in the second, you know, act of my life. And when I'm in that coffin, that's going to be the third. So I had a plate, an actual crypt plate made that on the top, it says um, to die must be an awfully big adventure, Peter Pan. And it has my name, the year I was born, and then under it, instructions, close your eyes, open your heart, I'm here. And what I've been doing consistently since that time, which is going on eight, nine years now, it's, I go and I hang out there. I put good vibes, you know, like a sense, you know, I play the harmonica there. I, you know, on my birthday, people come and we just, we don't talk about death or anything. We talk about what's going on in our lives, but we do it in front of the crypt. So my crazy mind about there are not ghosts. This is energy that we have not figured out how to channel three times in a row so it can be a science. As far as I'm concerned, when there's a horrible occurrence in a place, you know, there's residual energy that stays in there and it's considered haunted. In the same way you go to your, you know, your grandmother's house years later and it's like, I can feel grandma in here. I did, you know, are you, or are you just thinking it in your head? But I think certain people are tuned to pick up certain things, something they might smell, something they might feel, something they actually might even see. So my plan is well, after I'm gone, this is a modem and whoever comes, you know, close your eyes, open your heart, see if something happens. I could be completely full of shit or <laughs> I could be on the beginning of a very cool paranormal, you know, experiment that if it works, great. If it doesn't work, it was fun trying, right? So, and people go, why do you want to do this? This makes no sense. You won't even know that, you know, when something happens, I go, doesn't matter. Right now, I know. Right now, I've got something to look forward to. And how many people are, are looking forward to, you know, that part of their life after they're gone? That said, I've got 30 more years as far as I'm concerned. I came in in 1950. I'm going out, you know, in, in 2050. So I just got to do some good shit for the next 30 years as I, you know, prepare for the third act. And am I crazy? Obviously. But is it fun? Is it, you know, a, a great strange idea of entertainment. Yeah, absolutely. Tom, you were one of the most interesting people I've ever had the chance to talk to, man. And, and uh, people were saying, dude, Tom, look at Tom, man. He's putting 20 year olds to shame. The dude's just, he's, he's rolling. He's rocking and rolling. I mean, it's so great to see you just kicking ass, man. It's, it's awesome. You know, you, know? you, gotta love, you just got to love life. You got to love people. You got to love, I think, you know, the whole idea of creating things and, sharing them and collaborating. I mean, that's really what it's about, guys. I mean, it's there's something wonderful when you come up with something, but it's even better when you're like sharing it with somebody, writing a script together or making a movie all together and everybody going, yeah, that was great. You know, that, oh, the way the blood went up there. Oh, that was great. You know, it's a ball, you know, when you're doing it and you hope, you know, when it's done, it works and people like it, you know, and that's, you know, that's obviously the, you know, the most important thing and it survives and it's, I thank you guys so much that this movie, you know, over three decades later, still survives, still is being discovered by, you know, new audiences. And the people who've been loyal to it have been incredibly loyal. And I, I'm incredibly blessed with that. And I thank you a lot for that. Yeah. That's, I mean, and that right there is the absolute perfect way to end the show. So everybody, thank you for joining us. This was... I'm sure for all 81 of you out there right now, this is probably just as much of a thrilling experience as it was for me. It's absolutely an honor. Like I said bef before, when I had bad internet, if you would have told a young Christian Hannah when he's watching Friday the 13th Part 6 for the first time and loving it, you're going to talk to that guy one day. You're going to get, <laughs> you're going to have a great conversation. I would have said there's no way, but uh, here I am all these years later. So this is an absolute honor. This yeah. is. Well, the beginning Getting of a friendship too. I always look at these things. You meet people and your friends, you know, that's, you yeah. know, carry that on. So that this, this is amazing. So Tom, thank you so much, man. I mean, okay. you know, thank uh, you. This I, has I, been I, amazing. I all. It was fun. You know, I really enjoyed doing these things. I can't wait to tell all my friends, Hey man, I talked to Tom and he's buying a King Kong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just so. got to, I just got to get the fucker over here. You know, I got to get <laughs> truck and hey. manpower. Did Do it I, like they did in the movie. Drag yeah. his ass on a boat. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> 
Okay, guys. Right, so guys. listen. Thank you, Christian. It was been great. Thank all you guys. I'm sorry about not being able to answer everybody's questions, but uh, I mean, if there's a way that you've got a copy of any of the stuff that you can send me out, I can, you know, try to get to some of them and, and send sure. them back. And down the road, Tom, don't worry. I'm not going to bug you. I'm sure you have people bug you all the, all the time. Down the road, I would love to have another conversation because there's still so much more stuff I could talk to you about, you know, but there's only, we can only do so much, you know, yeah. in a night. But so, yeah. yeah, thank you guys. This is amazing. This is Christian Hannah Hoar, who just had a living legend on his show, Tom McLaughlin. So thank you. Thank I love you guys. you guys and good night. Peace out.